um, finally it did. And they said, well, how would you guys like to try your hand at writing a song for a, a, a Winnie the Pooh movie? They want to capture the essence of the Sherman Brothers, old you know, classic songs, and it's going to be a 2D movie and we're going to reboot the franchise right we're going to do the real watercolor backgrounds and all this stuff and we got so excited because and it was finally a, but it was on spec and it was mm. against other teams yeah it wasn't it wasn't exclusive it was and we got the gig we got the gig and i had a two week old or like i think they asked i mm-hmm. this was all going down when we were living in the twilight zone with a four-year-old and, and a two-week-old infant. I remember writing that demo like at three in the morning, mm-hmm. uh, breastfeeding, like, we're up anyway. Let's, <laughs> let's just do this. <laughs> um, but we were just so excited because finally a real Disney animated movie and everyone's going to know about it. So we were telling people, <laughs> oh, yeah, we're going to, we, we had this movie, Disney movie. It's going to be great. You haven't heard of it yet, but you will. And... Um, and then the, the studio leadership changed, and the guy that took over said, why are we doing a Winnie the Pooh movie? Because little kids don't go to the movie theaters anymore, and um, you know, b- over four wouldn't be caught dead doing Winnie the Pooh. That's for babies, and blah, blah, blah. So he said, we're shelving this movie. We're going to re- release it the same day as Harry Potter. And they, there was like no advertising. And all of a sudden, we were like, oh. <laughs> People would ask us, if we'd had anything come out lately and we'd be like, yeah, we did this Winnie the Pooh movie. They'd be like, oh, really? When's it coming out? <laughs> oh. uh, um, yeah. And then so then when Frozen, they, they offered us Frozen, we were like, all right, fine. It's a Disney princess movie. Probably be nothing, but... Um. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was a good lesson in not getting your expectations, just doing the work for the sake of the work. And we got to really spend some great time and learn amazing lessons from the story minds in the in the brain trust at Disney and Pixar, um, which is a pretty extraordinary experience to be a fly on the wall for, because there's some really smart story minds in there. So you had some experience already before they asked you about Frozen. Um, yeah, I, I mean they saw <laughs> we we were chiming in on like. Tigger's Ark during Winnie the Pooh, um, and they saw that Such we as it was. that we had a, a, there. There really isn't an arc. You can't give these characters too much of an arc, um, more than just oh, I need honey. Like that is his. <laughs> he's hungry. <laughs> he's hungry, and he he's gonna get honey at the end of the movie. Um, <laughs> But they saw us try and make it slightly more complicated and, and said, like, oh, these guys like to chime in on story and they think a lot about story and music. And we do. I mean, that's, that's what we do in, in our collaborations with Disney is we're very much involved in the story on a DNA level down to what the character wants and how the character speaks and all of that so that then we can write songs that don't feel inorganic or just popped in. Well, in the original script, Elsa was a villain, right? That's right. And you were going to write a villain song for her, but you wrote Let It Go instead. And they rewrote the whole movie based on that song. Is that true? More or less. I mean, that's a simplified version of it, as, as these things happen in the press. Um, but yes, we, at the time, we didn't know whether Elsa... Uh, we were already on the side of, like, let's not make Elsa a villain. Like, why make the powerful, magical one a villain? Um, uh, and so it was on the fence, but in the in the outline that we had, it was called Elsa's Badass Song. And we <laughs> knew it was going to be, the things that we knew were, it wasn't going to be your typical Disney princess song. We're, it was going to probably be more in the singer-songwriter genre type of song, like Sarah Bareilles or Amy Mann or Tori Amos. Or, um, and we when we started writing it, it was actually Bobby. We were walking through Prospect Park, and Bobby was like, you know, I, I just feel like it reminds me of when I was in high school and I worked so hard and I didn't drink and I didn't do drugs and I didn't do anything except study and work really, really hard. And then I blew one test and I blew that test. And no, I never blew a test. I just imagined what it would be like. <laughs> <laughs> He imagined what it would be like uh, if the, he had the blown his test. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, 
uh, but he imagined how terrible it would be because he was trying to be perfect through his whole high school career. And that really got us thinking more and more about what does it feel like to be living with that kind of pressure to be perfect and how many of us have these things. I mean, me, as a mother, I, I spoke about how hard it is to, like, the the expectations for a working mother today are so impossible to match like what's the why do we have to make quinoa salad like it's <laughs> just a stupid thing to do um, um, but you're supposed to and <laughs> um, and you know there are just so many hoops we're supposed to jump through and so I put that that part of it and Bobby put his perfectionist I guess I had a little of the perfectionist high school girl in me too, just not as perfection as Yale. I just got myself to Williams, um, and uh, and yeah. So uh, I understand that the vamp was Bobby's and the hook was yours. Yes. Yes. And you stood up on the bench on Prospect Park on the table. Yeah, I think Kristen did. I don't think I don't remember standing up there myself. Did I? In my mind, I liked that picture, <laughs> but I think it was just me. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think I was just sort of fanning her to get the wind going through her hair. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you do really stupid things in the creative process. Well, we do stupid, stupid things in the creative process. I mean, you, I, I, if you see me rewriting lines right now in the rehearsal room, people think like I'm angry or because I'm acting. I'm. I have to like act it. I have to get into the character and be like, oh, okay. Um, and for Elsa, I was trying to be up on a mountain, yeah. feeling like all of my secrets had just come out and everyone had turned on me. And that's where, where the improv language can start to come out and you can get stuff to grab from. It's Absolutely. like playing. I, I, I want them to put an ice statue of you up on that, <laughs> up on that thing, coming up with that song. I think it's a terrific story. Uh, tell me about, uh, do you want to build a snowman? The song was in and then it was out and then it was in again. Yeah, um, <clears throat> that song, we, <clears throat> we really loved that song when we first wrote it. It was a different form than, we, than it ended up in the film because there, it, the song does so much storytelling and all of the, um, but actually the song itself doesn't really do the storytelling. The storytelling is in the, the, um, the breaks, the montages between each verse. And um, so the first version of it started at a different point in the movie and ended at a slightly, ended at the same point. But... Um, it just didn't. It just didn't have the same feeling when we saw it all together, and there was no uh, "I want" song in that draft. So everyone said, "Look, cut that song. You need an I want" song." And we ended up writing the, for the first, first time, time in forever, forever song. And um, once we saw it with that, the film worked, but everybody missed the Snowman song, and we saw an opportunity to kind of uh, rally for for that to come back in. And in fact. Even like rank and file Disney people would write emails saying, "Oh, what happened to the Snowman song? We liked that." And they actually, it's the first time that they said that, that was the first time that it ever happened at Disney that people had written requesting a song back in. They usually write in <laughs> saying, "Please cut that." Yeah. Um, the one thing that's fun, a fun fact about that song is our daughter sings it, um, sings the first verse, and so that's I. It's always a warm thing for me. Um, and that it was all inspired by, we were talking about, talking and talking about the girl's backstory. And one of the, uh, his name is Paul... Briggs. Briggs, it's our head story. of story, was just doodling. And he doodled this picture of these two girls behind a door. And I think it was... One we, of the, yeah, I remember he was like, he was, he was writing doodling. and all we could hear over the, over the teleconf uh, the video conference was... was Squeak, squeak, squeak of his marker. And we we're like, what's Paul what doing? Paul what's what's doing? happening over there? And uh, he showed us this picture of a door and two kids on either side. And we we're like, now that's the song. Yeah. Let's write that. Uh, that. That is what our song is. That, that is their backstory, is that thing that the older sister does to the younger sister. And we know it in our own life of slamming the door. You can't play with me. Um, it <laughs> happens every day. <laughs> were there any songs from Frozen that were that you liked that were cut from the movie? Yeah. Yeah, there were lots. Yeah. Um, we're going to show some at D23 in August. We're doing a whole panel on the cut songs that came before the songs that stayed in the movie. There's a song that no one has seen except for a few people um, called Cool With Me back when, when Elsa was a villain. 
And it was sort of um, the kind of older sister song of like, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself, stop hitting yourself. It, it was like an older sister. Well, stop freezing yourself. Yeah, stop it was freezing stop freezing yourself. yourself. Um, but it, it, it also had that sort of uh, Sarah borellis kind of feel. That was a fun one. Yeah, writing songs for something like Frozen is a tough assignment. What's the difference between writing songs for musicals than writing songs for any other genre? You mean um, any other? What's the difference between a theater song and oh, just a, theater a, song and a, and a pop song? Or? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, I wouldn't know because I can't write a pop song. Every time I try to write a pop song, somebody in the pop world says, that's, that's really Broadway. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I can't grasp the difference. I can't quite... I personally have a hard time because they they have the same form, you know, it's like verse, chorus, bridge, um, all that stuff. But I think I think the relationship of words and music is is just vastly different. They think of melody in different terms. They think of the function of lyrics in different terms. And of course, we all know and love pop songs, but but my brain doesn't have the the necessary equipment to write one. When we turned Let It Go, when Demi Lovato was doing Let It Go as a cover, we were told by the pop producer that we had too much melodic material and that we had to take out some th- some of the melody, which is how we ended up with the bridge that's like, standing frozen in the life of chosen, you won't find me, the past is all behind me. Yeah. And, um, it's like, da-na, da-na, da-na. He was like, uh, it gives the ear a break from your melodies. Good. Yeah, he was like, there's just too much melodic information, which is a totally different way. Is, uh, yeah. Uh, of thinking about it, and, you know, he he, he diagrammed it for us. He was like, "Okay, first you start with da 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 da." Okay, I got that. And then you go on this other thing, da 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 da. Okay, then you have the chorus, da 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 da. And then you have another thing, da 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 da. And I just can't take it off. Um, but if you listen to Taylor Swift, which we have been doing a lot, um, <laughs> she she has this ability to have like these simple rhythmic things, like shake it off, shake it off, oh oh, shake it off, shake it off. I mean, the, and player's gonna play. Like there are two components, and she mixes them up in really interesting ways, and they're and it's produced beautifully. But they are like these little things that stick in your brain, um, and. I just remember. I just remember asking the Disney executive, like when he said, "Think about a pop version of Let It Go." I was like, "Okay, all right. Um, pop songs have uh, like guitar solos anymore, or like." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, I, I could probably find that out by just like listening to one." <laughs> so, Bobby, you wrote Avenue Q, Book of Mormon, Winnie the Pooh, and Frozen. How on earth do you switch hats like that? Oh yeah, I've been wanting to to um, create a medley, like a X-rated, <laughs> G-rated medley. Um, <laughs> um, but no, I don't know. It, for me, I guess I, I think all this stuff exists, you know, in everybody's head, every adult's head. You know, um, we've all been kids. We've all and we've all grown up. And um, well, knowing the original title, the Let It Go, now it explains <laughs> a lot to me. Um, Fuck it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, tell us, tell us about the. It was really you'll cut that bit, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, you too. Just oh, close your ears, oh, sorry. okay? <laughs> <laughs> tell us about uh, tell us about the show in La Jolla. Um, it's called Up Here, and I I have to say this is a brainchild of Bobby's from back in his BMI days. Actually, this is it was something that he's always been thinking about and he pitched when we were dating um he would pitch me and and he was gonna he was reaching out to like Pulitzer Prize book writers and I was helping him write the letters to it uh and then I was starting to shape it in those letters to to like Tony Kushner um and he was like maybe you should write this with me um and and I was like yes okay I will um so you should tell because it's his brainchild yeah yeah um the idea was, to, I mean, I always called it the consciousness musical because I wanted to write a musical about consciousness um, and more specifically, my consciousness um, because I'm, I'm sort of a, a very a kind of more withdrawn 
guy and like Kristen said it takes a while to get to know me and I'm shy and I I am often in my own way and get a little social anxiety and don't don't mix quite as quickly with people even though um I'm likable and I'm nice and uh, <laughs> <laughs> um anyway so uh so I always wanted to and I always felt like I've got a lot going on that doesn't show to to anyone else when I'm interacting with them I've got a lot of I've got like a musical in my head. I've got a, I've got a, you know, a whole weird symphony of mixing styles and all that stuff. And I, I also was fascinated by the idea that we can't ever fully grasp what, what's in someone else's head. You can't, you can't ever really get out of this universe that's in your own head. And um, when Kristen brought up the idea of, well, why don't we put the, take this guy and put him in a relationship to bring out, to, to really fire up the story, then that totally made sense. So really it's a love triangle story um, between a guy, a woman, and his own head. Um, and and the, the fact that it's a guy who has this incredible inner universe, and he his arc is to learn how to have this inner universe and still be able to communicate and have faith in communication in this outer universe. Um, and uh, along the way, we go to some pretty crazy kaleidoscopic places because we're bringing to life the, the critical and the joyful and the sexual and the, um, the memories and the things that we love and the things that we hate and all of the things that... that um, even when you go to make the phone call after you've met the girl that you love uh, and you, you're just thinking about, do I call her? Do I have the courage? What do I say? It's such a small thing on the outside and it's such an epic battle on the inside. <laughs> so um, we have an epic battle happening then. And uh, that's kind of the and when people of would the show. when people would read our first draft, they'd say, oh, it's very cute. It's a little, a little musical, like a chamber musical, right? And we were like, did you read the stage directions, though? Um, because, because the life of the mind, like the world of the brain, is, is enormous. It's infinite. And um, the, the key ingredient to us was that the show feel big. It would be a big show about a small story. Um, and, uh, and that was a hard sell to producers because um, it's very hard to take that visual jump. Excuse me. Um, and, uh, and imagine what that would be like in a theater. Um, and what's very cool is that La Jolla Playhouse committed to this, um, to this kind of rather elaborate um, production um, headed by Alex Timbers, who has brought his visual um, palette to the, to the production and, and embellished it even more. Um, and we're right in the middle, really, of, of figuring out, this is the first time we've ever seen things like the beautiful dancing cactuses brought to life. <laughs> so, and these levels, and what is what is it like when you lock up those two characters in a cage and they are hanging over a love scene? Um, we're we're just seeing what our what we've got right now, and which is thrilling and terrifying. And we're so lucky to have this developmental step because there's no there are other projects where you can like my acapella project, you can do with six chairs in a in a studio and know kind of what you're getting. In this case, we really didn't know the full story until we realized it visually. Um, and the other fun and rather interesting thing about this show is that when we, were, when we went to brainstorm about it, we wrote in a big, on a big sheet of paper, and the B plot is about a rock. And, and it's the kind of thing that you were like, you would normally look at it and be like, I don't know what I meant by that. But um, in this case, we did. And we, so we also tell simultaneously the story of a non-conscious being and, um, so that we can make that juxtaposition. From the, from, from the Big Bang through the formation of the sun and, um, and the continents colliding. and I don't want to tell too much. <laughs> I don't want to give it away. I, I, but it's about the, what happens when these two collide right. a little bit. Um, so it's not your typical romantic comedy. <laughs> <laughs> so you start previews when? July 28th. July 28th. 28th. Yep. All, if all goes well. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Well, do you have any advice to songwriters out there starting out? Our biggest uh, advice is to join, join the BMI, BMI workshop. Join BMI if you want to not only learn the craft, 
but you also get a community. You find your tribe in New York. Um, it's certainly what I, I had my sister, my one sister do, and I think I'm going to have my other sister do it when she moves to New York. And anyone, anyone who is creative and loves musical storytelling, it's just it's the best free resource in the city. It, it, it's it changed my life completely. I would not, I would be, who knows what I'd be. I'd be working with schizophrenic patients at the Bronx VA hospital, which is what I was doing when I joined the Bronx. That's my old job. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so any questions? Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, for me, um, uh, Matt Stone and Trey Parker were my comedy heroes after graduating college. I mean, that was the, they were they were definitely it for me. And and um, you know, like um, Tina Fey, Amy Poehler mm -hmm. for me, um, absolutely fabulous. Uh, uh, Christopher Guest. Um, oh yeah, all the like the Will waiting Brooks. for Guffman, yeah. um, all of that stuff. Uh, what else? Bobby loves Mystery Science Three Thousand. Yeah, Mystery Science um, Theater Three Thousand. Yeah, he, he, that's I just how met he... Joel. I'm I'm just freaking out. Super... I love it too. Yeah. It's just I just can't get her to watch it with me <laughs> every night. I fall asleep. <laughs> I fall asleep. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Which song? Uh, some, something very silly about the human being being a they get together. creation and then how that... It all starts with fucking, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Did it again. I wish they were more in my line of sight, so I would not do that. Sorry. Could you sing it now and let me video it? I won't publish it. I just want to show my wife. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to give her the message, um, or? <laughs> Aww. You know, I think it's online. I think you can find it. Um, I, uh, they did it for that BMI songbook um, special, and it was sung by, oh, who was it? Um, oh, you Lauren Kennedy. Lauren Child? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you put Lauren, Lauren Kennedy, Kennedy I think it's called song. the pregnancy song because it was written for a cabaret that a lot of when actresses are pregnant, they have to leave their Broadway shows. Um, so it's a great and then they can do cabarets and stuff. So we wrote it for pregnant actresses when they have to go out of their shows because the costumes don't fit. Yeah, um, they call themselves the hot mamas. Yeah. The pregnancy song. The pregnancy pregnancy song. song. songwriters as work for hire rather than owning your own publishing is that correct and do they control the publishing when you write for a Disney project or? for Disney yeah it's their um, their uh, they have a, a different deal than almost any other studio the animated the animated side of Disney yeah how does it work do you can you talk about it at all um, I don't know I mean it's uh, it's oh, we're so bad at this stuff we're not really very smart not, about it it's but not the, the, thing, the <laughs> thing the thing about it is I think it all came from When You Wish Upon a Star mm -hmm. they took that song I think it was pre-existing or they they had it written for Pinocchio and um, and they split the publishing with the writer in, in, in the normal way and it's a dis I mean it is it is the Disney song it's totally related to Disney and they realized that um, they should not um, that they should control the publishing because they have a different relationship to. So I, I'm arguing their case. I shouldn't. But, yeah. No. Uh, I mean, <laughs> we. I, understand, I mean, I just was wondering if that if I had heard correctly because I knew that uh, I, I've known other people who have done work for them and the contract has been a work for hire type of contract. Yeah. Well, that's no, what movies I mean, are. You movies guys are know you've worked for Disney, right? You two. Um, it's like that, right? Yeah. It's work for hire. I mean, there's still obviously things like mechanicals and 
Yeah. That's right. You get your music publishing, you get your BMI, you get your mechanical royalties, um, and you try and maximize that. Honestly, there's a little box in my head where I take all of that stuff and I, <laughs> and I put it and I, and I file it away. Like, I know it, and I just don't want to know it because it, it has nothing to do with the creative process, right. and it can really get in the way sometimes if you start thinking about things like that. So I, I do really, I, it's, it's completely blocked. Okay. <laughs> I'll go on this side. Yeah. Uh, it's a chicken and egg kind of scenario. You write to um, uh, to a story that you've all agreed on, and then that song is storyboarded, um, and then quite often you rewrite um, based on what you see. Very often you chuck the whole thing. Um, but with the case, are you talking about? Do you want to build a snowman? Yeah. Yeah, that one in particular. Um, that was a that was a very special case because we always knew that it was going to be a film montage as well as a song, and we'd never written the music for a film montage before, so we just sketched in dummy stuff for, for, a, for a very long time until the end. And, you know, actually, we, we got to know Chris Beck, the guy who wrote the, the film score, and that we thought, oh, my gosh, this would be a wonderful collaboration between his skills and our skills, and, um, and he, he took a, a pass at those at those um, middle sections, and we just loved what he did. Another really fun fact is that Bobby and Chris Beck were in the same a cappella group at Yale, just different times. Yeah. Like they never overlapped, but they both came from the same world of men hanging out and singing. <laughs> <laughs> Todd has been waiting. Um, well... So move to New York. Move to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, a, one is just keep writing. Keep writing and yeah. listen to what. Find out what you love, and write from that place. Um, I, again, we're we're right in the middle of a, a a high pressure project, and our one true north is for us is to write the show we want to see. And when we get lost, when we get a lot of voices and notes, um, sorry, um, it's it's very important for us to know our aesthetic and, and what we love and how we love stories being told. Um, you know, I watch Bobby. Bobby loves to immerse himself in the things that he loves, um, as do I. Um, they're very different, but Bobby, Bobby will watch, like, Waiting for Guffman, over and over and over and over again. Um, self-soothing. <laughs> it is a little self-soothing. Um, I guess it's better than like sucking his thumb. But uh, <laughs> um, that was the G version, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but. I, I think knowing what you love and knowing how to craft what you love, I, you know, I just, I just saw Fun Home, and I wrote a note to, I want to go back and see Fun Home again and again and again because it is something that, it, it brought up that ache in me that was like, I want to do something like that, and I want to know how to do something like that, and I want to know how every choice led to this beautiful feeling that I had while watching it. So I think, I think that's a huge, um, and then resilience, just resilience. Like, don't, don't let the voices in your head saying, like, you don't know what you're doing speak too loud. Make sure you, got, you surround yourself with those other voices that are like, this is beautiful, magical stuff you're putting in the world. musicals um well i mean I lyrics um it's so one of the things that i always pay attention to is that in lyrics you're going to hear them once if you, any audience member or moviegoer is going to hear the lyrics once so you don't want to be putting the 
exposition that's like, at seven o'clock, the car is going to come by. And when the car comes by, if it has a yellow flag, <laughs> then you're, you can go. Like, you, that does not belong in a lyric because it'll, it could wash over you. That's and then you material, won't know. Yeah. That's book material stuff. But um, the lyrics... Uh, yeah, you want to tell the story, especially on stage. On stage, what you're watching is not really a series of events happening. You're watching a character go through an emotional crucible. And every part of the story, especially the musical parts, have to be um, an emotional turn. So every, every song needs to take a character or characters from one place to another. And um, the, both the music and the lyrics need to be taking you on that journey with that character. That's the most important, that's the fundamental thing that they need to do. And I think that there is, yeah, the, there's the clarity thing. You can overdo the clarity thing too, because think of some of your favorite songs. You didn't understand all the lyrics the first time, and yet you wanted to. Sometimes they leave little, little um, pebbles of mystery of like, what was that word? What was that line? I want to go back and Jellicle read that. Cats. Yeah, it's <laughs> a jellical cat. They, uh. they kept asking it, but they didn't answer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You talked about um, relative to Winnie the Pooh, which, by the way, I saw. Thanks. All right. I appreciate that. Oh, cool. Oh, thank cool. you. I played Kanga. Is that the one in L.A.? <laughs> oh, yeah, cool. Zoe, that was Zoe Dacian. Yeah. In our very limited experience, the the pool they're gonna pull from tend to be those people that they've that are already on their radar. Um, so they might have a couple of different teams try and compete for a job, um, but they will be teams that have already kind of gotten noticed in some way. Um, so I think the best in terms of like how to get yourself in that pool. Um, it's write a show and get it produced and get it out there in the world. Or, you know, for us, our, we, our first jobs were for TheaterWorks USA. Both of us had our, our first job for TheaterWorks, like writing for a young audience. It's always a great stepping stone to learn um, what it's like to have to tell a story in 50 minutes with song. And it's practical experience, getting, getting the experience of what it's like to realize, oh, that song didn't work, got to rewrite it now. None of your arguments can can um, trump that the thing didn't work. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, we have run out of time, and I'm very sad because this hour has just flown by. Uh, uh, so thank you all for coming, and a big thank hand you. for Bobby and Christian Anderson thank Lopez. You.